Hey, Ben Pearson, the Grocer Tracker. In my last video, I talked about Elon Musk's plans to nuke the planet Mars and why that might not be the best idea out there. One of the questions that I got frequently in the comments, though, was, hey, what about asteroids? Would that work any better? So let's track that issue down here. Generally speaking, there are three different ways that you could use asteroids to terraform Mars. The first one would be to use the gases that they contain, which primarily would be carbon dioxide and water, to improve the atmosphere of the planet. The second one is to use the heat of the impacts itself to melt the natural reserves at the, say, North Pole and South Pole of Mars of water and carbon dioxide, and you'd be able to do some terraforming there. The third one is a little bit more out there, but it's to try to ram these rocks to increase the gravity of Mars so it's better able to hold on to the atmosphere and, generally speaking, be, be more Earth-like. So let's track these down one at a time. The first one is to use the gases itself. So in order to understand that, we need to understand the three different types of asteroids. They are C-type, S-type, and M-type. C-type asteroids is carbonaceous. They have a lot of carbon. They're basically leftovers from the primitive sun. They don't have any of the volatiles like helium, hydrogen, water, and stuff like that that would just tend to fly away, but they have a very similar composition to the sun, namely carbon and oxygen and some other trace metals in there. They're by far the most common type of asteroid. In fact, we see them everywhere. About 75% of asteroids are C-type. They're probably the most useful ones for terraforming, too. The other ones, S-type, which is stony, has a lot of silicon, has some metals in there. They're kind of sort of useful, but probably not the best for terraforming. And then there's the M-type, which if you've seen a meteorite, you've probably seen an M-type. The M stands for metals. They have a lot of iron and nickel in them and thus are pretty metal rich. They're very dense. They're able to withstand the entry into the Earth's atmosphere, which is why we see them commonly in asteroids. Generally speaking, we don't see a lot of S or C types that survive the entry process, although they are more common than the M types. Of some note also is comets. Comets are similar in composition to the asteroids, but because they form further out in the solar system, they tend to have more water that water hasn't been sublimated away. So they also could potentially be useful. Okay, so we know that at least one of the more common types of asteroids has a lot of carbon and oxygen, which could be used to make carbon dioxide, which as we all know is a major greenhouse gas. Now, how big of an asteroid would you need to make this work? Well, if we assumed that the entire asteroid was made out of dry ice, and we know what the density of that is, we know that we need about 3,900 trillion metric tons of carbon dioxide in order to really terraform Mars to raise the temperatures up to something that could support liquid water easily. So, you can do the math, and it turns out that you would need about 137 kilometer square cube rock of pure dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. That's about 85-ish miles. Huge, huge rock, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility. It turns out that this mass comes to be about a quarter of a percent of the mass of the asteroid belt. So. There is the chemicals out there, we just have to be able to go and get them. If this rock was pure water, incidentally, that would be about 157 kilometers, which is just a little bit less than 100 miles. Also of some note, though, is that the asteroids don't really have exactly the materials that we would need. You have silicon, which would not actually be a useful greenhouse gas, so you'd have to mix these up. The second idea is to just have the heat directly and impact them into the poles where they can heat up all of the gases and release them. How much energy would that take? Well, from our previous video, we know that it takes an enormous amount of energy, and I'm not going to rehash that. But it turns out that the amount of energy that's required is on the same order of magnitude as the asteroid that hit that resulted in the death of all of the dinosaurs. And and the, off of the Yucatan Peninsula, I forget 
how to pronounce the name of that, but it's over here. So when this asteroid hit, it released the energy of millions of nuclear weapons. And it did actually heat up the atmosphere, but not quite just because of the direct heat. This asteroid released four primary gases into the atmosphere. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, both of these are greenhouse gases, carbon monoxide, which is not, but we'll get back to that, and silicon dioxide, which is not a particularly great greenhouse gas either. But the carbon monoxide is the interesting one. See, it in and of itself is not a great greenhouse gas, but it is very, very reactive because it wants another oxygen. Carbon dioxide is a very stable compound. Carbon monoxide is not. So in the resulting chemical processes, this event released a bunch of methane and ozone from this carbon monoxide, and those are very, very good greenhouse gases. So what happened with all of those? Well, they raised the temperature about 5 degrees Celsius, about 10-ish degrees Fahrenheit, and that is a significant amount, as we know from the global warming studies today, that that can cause some huge amounts. Now, it also did knock a huge cloud of dust into the upper parts of the atmosphere that probably resulted in some very short-term cooling, and certainly a loss of anything that depended on photosynthesis for life. But it still is of some note. We know that we could get enough gas from an asteroid impact to get there, although it would take a lot of work. Before we start looking into how you could do this, let's take a look at the other idea, which is to try to make Mars more massive so that way it could hold the gases in better. You see, because of the gravity of Mars, it's only able to hold gases that are relatively heavy, such as carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen. It can't hold water vapor, it can't hold methane, and it certainly can't hold helium or hydrogen. Of course, you can't hold those in Earth's atmosphere either. You can see a nice chart here of exactly what planetary objects can hold which gases. In theory, if you were to put some metallic asteroids in there, you could make Mars a little bit denser, but it would take an enormous amount. See, Mars's surface gravity is about 35% of Earth's, which is a fair bit, but it's not terrible. It's about twice that of the moon's. But the mass of Mars is only 10% of Earth's. If you were going to make Mars to be massive enough to match Earth's gravity, you would need to increase its size by 10 times. You would basically have to ram the planet Venus into Mars, and then the resulting object might have enough. Suffice it to say, this is probably not a good idea. In fact, if you can do this, I don't understand why you're watching this video, because your technology is so far beyond anything that is even reasonable today that you're not going to get anything out of this. So that really isn't too realistic to increase the gravity. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Well, if there's an asteroid that's about to hit Mars, we could potentially just nudge it a little bit to get it in that right direction. We have the ability to modify the trajectory of an asteroid a little bit. This is going to be tested with the DART mission, the Double Asteroid Redirect Test, that SpaceX is going to launch on behalf of NASA here in a couple of years. Now, DART is going to go intercept the small asteroid moon of Didymus, which is nicknamed Diddy Moon, and because they're a double system, we'll be able to detect the change in velocity a lot easier than we would be able to use something else. The orbital velocity will change and we'll be able to get a really good idea without having to wait a whole huge amount of time. Basically, this is a kinetic vehicle. It's going to intercept the asteroid at a high speed and use its mass to knock it off. There are some other more advanced ways that we could potentially do the easiest way to very carefully manage it would be to use some kind of a space tug where you put a little object out in front of it that has enough mass that you can slowly tractor it into the direction you want. But the most likely one would be what's called a mass driver. Basically, you could put 
a railgun of sorts on the asteroid and you feed some of the material from the asteroid itself to accelerate it into the direction you want to go. Basically, you toss in anything that you don't particularly want. And if we were going to do this to Mars, we'd probably toss out the nickel, the silicon, and the iron that exists on this rocky body because we don't want any of those. They're not really that useful here. You fire those off in the right direction. You can change your speed and gradually go and impact this. Now, this kind of stuff is something within our realm of the, say, 50 to 100 years type of technology that we could do. If Starship pans out to be everything that it's claiming to be, then this is very, very much in that realm of possibility. But there's an issue. We could only do this for objects that are already relatively close. We're going to have to take about a quarter of a percent of the asteroid belt and redirect it into the planet Mars. This is not going to be an easy feat. You're not just going to be able to take the near Mars objects. So you're going to be able to have to do this on a massive scale. But it still could theoretically work. The TV series and book series, The Expanse, probably gets this right that maybe in 500 to 1,000 years we'll have the technology to do this once we're able to very freely roam throughout the solar system with no real concerns. But until that happens, this isn't really something that we could do. I'm not sure if there's something else that we're missing that we might be able to terraform Mars, but I'm really beginning to think that this is in the distant future, barely in the realm of reasonable science fiction of something that we could do. Let me know, though, if I'm missing something in the comments below. I certainly would want to hear what you guys have to say, and it's entirely possible there's some relatively easy way that I'm just totally missing, but I just don't see it right now. Thank you also to my Discord members and my Patreons for helping to fund this and some of the upgrades that I've been doing. You guys are awesome. Until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.